right side of that. So cool. Thanks for getting that. Yeah. Um, so we did a bunch of prep for this and then have like recently decided in the last 10 minutes just to kind of ig ig ignore all of it. How's um, everyone doing? Everyone having a good night? Yeah. Woo! You ready to talk about some SAS? Yeah. <laughs> no? Great. Cool. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So yeah. it's going to be awesome. Should be a good time. So yeah. the first thing I'm interested in is, because I actually haven't heard it because despite us only meeting at conferences, yeah. I've never actually heard one of your talks. Christian um, and I are conference friends. Yeah. Um, that's the only time we hang out. Yeah. So it's good. It's like six or seven times a year. Yeah, yeah it's a good amount of time. Um, so like, how did it start? How do you start ProfitWell? And I hear there's a dramatic, exciting... There's a dramatic story. ...founding yeah. story. Okay. You, first, who here has heard of ProfitWell or Price Intelligently? Okay. Who here is just for the free booze? <laughs> is that... Okay, honesty is a really good policy. So I like that. So um, just for those of you who don't know, we started off about six years ago as Price Intelligently... Um, focused exclusively on helping uh, basically subscription companies specifically get their pricing right using data um, and using our software. And we've kind of evolved into focusing particularly on subscription growth. So today we have a product called ProfitWell Metrics, which is basically free subscription financial metrics. You plug it into your billing system and basically get access to your MRR, your churn, all those kind of fun um, stats, and then we sell products on top of it to help with not only pricing still, but also to help with um, you know, churn. Um, that awesome pitch aside, uh, basically the, the way we started, so we're a bootstrap company, we're about 60 people now in Boston, um, have raised no cash, just kind of like out of the gate, um, worked in big tech back in the day, uh, when back in the day, in my early 20s. Uh, so I worked at Google for a little while and I actually started my career working in US intelligence. Um, so that was kind of a fun bureaucratic stint that I had. Uh, and then when I was working at Google, I kind of wanted to do my own thing and kind of like break away from the bureaucracy of, you know, big tech. Um, so jumped into the fray and the like scary part of like jumping into the fray is like as a first time founder, like anyone here a first time founder currently? Only a couple. Okay, cool. Well, for those of you who don't know, being a first time founder is probably a terrible experience uh, for everyone. Uh, mainly because what ends up happening is like you have no idea what you're doing and everyone has some like crazy expectations for you. Um, for me, I jumped into the fray with some part-time co-founders. Anyone here have part-time co-founders? Yeah, part-time co-founders are terrible. Um, I hope you're not the part-time co-founder. Um, so I founded the company with a couple of folks. Um, and if you asked me two years ago, if we were doing this talk two years ago, I'd be like, fuck those guys, they're terrible. They screwed me over, like they're the worst, right? And I still partially feel that, um, but that's probably like the emotional side of this whole situation. Uh, but basically jumped in with part-time co-founders. None of us set expectations. Um, and they were like bigger in tech. So one of them leads product at HubSpot, um, which is a pretty big um, SaaS company. Um, and the other one was like a perennial CTO in the Boston area, which is where we're based. And uh, basically I was like, oh my God, like I get to start a company with these like really popular guys, but they also were first-time founders. So they didn't know what they were doing. Um, just to kind of get the embarrassing parts out of the way, um, I was on a vesting schedule. They were not on a vesting schedule. Um, I was the only full-time person, um, and I was like struggling as a non-technical person to basically get them to kind of like help. Um, and I don't think I, I think the most charitable interpretation of the situation was, "Hey, like we're all first-time. We don't know what's going on." They thought they were doing the best. I thought I was doing the best. Um, but really, a couple of lessons just to kind of get to the end. And everything's really good now. Um, but it basically took four years of me like having to threaten to tank the company a couple of times, um, also gaining a hundred pounds. That was probably like the biggest like terrible thing that happened. Um, and everything's great now, but it was like fighting tooth and nail to like basically fix the vesting schedule, fix the equity splits, um, and even just getting the right expectations set. And I think the big lessons, at least for me, were um, if you have part-time co-founders, um, really reevaluate like when part-time goes to full-time. Um, one of the co-founders, um, they basically were like, it was always like, next quarter, oh, next quarter, oh, when this happens, next quarter. Um, for the other, it was like, just never, but it was still one of those things where there was so much control that was kind of maintained. Um, but I think the other thing is just like setting expectations, especially with your exec team, um, even if you're not like in the early stages, um, it's one of those huge things that like, I'm sure you've gone through this, you know, a few other times of just like making sure that 
everyone's on the same page. And then I think the, the biggest thing is getting like into a place of emotional maturity. I think we don't talk about that a lot as like execs and as founders at companies where um, we all have like our own insecurities about what we're good at and what we're not good at. And if you multiply that by a lot of ego in the room or a lot of like aggressiveness in the room, what ends up happening is there's just a lot of conflict. Um, and I think if you get into a really good place and actually treat these relationships as relationships, because that's what they are, um, it tends to kind of net out in the end and you know, kind of fix it. So I'm happy to go into any depth. I think this is like an interesting, because we obviously took a slightly different path to starting the businesses. Um, They're similar in size, kind of, I think, revenue terms um, today. But obviously we took the venture back route, you took the bootstrap route. So we've raised $25 million, you've raised nothing. Yeah. And sort of, for us, it's sort of- You say that like it's a bad thing. (laughs) Like you say that like I feel- No, no, like, okay. Uh, (laughs) But, Sort of, we had this sort of like forced external expectation that like yeah. this is other people's money, this is a real deal, kind of. Not that you didn't, but yeah. I think that's an interesting kind of where our paths diverge of of kind of that founding story of both being first time founders, but kind of us. We raised money before we even started the company. So yeah. my kind of I had a project before when I was eighteen. I met an investor. Uh, he gave me one hundred and fifty k. Uh, with like no idea, no plan. It's just like, I'm sure you'll do something, um, which is an atypical fundraising experience. Such um, a good life, Christian as well. Yeah, I know, it's just like, it's so easy. Um, but like, that was like the forced expectation for us yeah. of like, this is full time, everybody commits to it. Um, how, sort of, how do you, do you use anything in terms of like non-execs, external advisors and things like that? Because sort of, yeah. I think we've always had a board and we've always had investors to sort of like keep us in check and hold us to account and also provide the sort of external kind of voice of reason sometimes when we are having those sort of emotionally immature kind of yeah. arguments with each other. Have you done anything sort of around that? So we, the thing that, I think the external motivation, internal motivation is like a big thing. And obviously you have internal motivation as mm. well. I think for us, not to like silver lining and like, you know, start to love my captors or anything like that, but like <laughs> basically uh, no Stockholm syndrome jokes. Is that not? Yeah, that's no, anyways. Not, is that a little too far? Okay. No, but, uh, yeah. but basically like, I think the rationalization here is because it was such like a cl- cluster of a problem early on and like the founding story I just described, like if it's not happening to you, it's probably happening to another friend. It's pretty common. I was really scared to like share it back in the day because I was like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I was such an idiot. And then all of a sudden I would talk to people who were like advisors and mentors and they're like, yeah, this happens all the time, which I was like, why? The same but, thing happens with investors. Like this oh, I'm sure. alignment yeah. of outcome of like, totally. you're shooting for this company to worth, be worth $10 million and we're shooting for it to be worth a billion dollars is kind of like an equally common occurrence. Totally, and even like, you know, former investors getting screwed over by current, and like there's a lot of stuff that happens there. I think for, for me though, like because it was such like a craziness, it forced us to either be like, all right, we're gonna get rid of this and start over, um, or we're gonna like make it work and like basically put, put the time in. And when I say put the time in, it's like, well, if you have something um, like they had in terms of equity, it was like, how do you, you don't take it away. Like you have to like prove out and basically you know, come to a really good understanding of like finding the right motivation for them. And so what actually helped a lot was external motivators in terms of advisors and mentors, because they helped me kind of like navigate how to like unfurl this problem um, of people having like a high stake, but no like, like if this succeeds, it's great. If it fails, like they have, they have yeah. no like skin in the game in the sense of like a job or a paycheck. Um, but I do think the other thing was like, and not to get too cliche, but like really the vision of what we were trying to do. Like we never sought to be like a small lifestyle business. Like we always wanted to be like a nice big business and we wanted to take on really, really big problems. It was really hard to see that from an external perspective and it still is for a lot of folks when they look at us. Um, One, because our product marketing is terrible. Apologies if you have no idea what we do because that's totally our fault. We should hire for that, we're trying. But also because like it's one of those things where you know, we started off bootstrapped and then we have this tech enabled service and then like, oh, we have this like, oh, this is just a little side thing you guys are doing. And, like all of a sudden it was like, no, we are like going after it. Um, and I don't think- Did you start as like a consulting business and then become yeah, or- Yeah, a lot of folks think we started as, it's kind of, it's not a bad thought. It's just, we started actually as a pure software company. Um, we had this product that you would send out survey data or for survey data and then we'd run it through our algorithms to measure price elasticity and like relative preference of features. And then what we found is that people 
if we got them the data, they still had this problem where they, they were smart. It's just they didn't have the confidence to use pricing data because most of us, we've never done pricing at a company. And maybe if we got an MBA, we took one class, but it was a theory based class. And so they were just like, hey, you know, can you help us? We'll pay you. And we we're like, Sh sure. Like how much? Um, ironically, you know, given what we did um, and what we do for a living. Um, but it was one of those things where all of a sudden it moved in this tech enabled service, um, which then turned into like a full subscription. So what's kind of funny is like our gross margin is about 78% on that product line, like, which is better. I think it's right at the median for like most software companies um, because it isn't a consulting company. You can't come to us and say like, hey, like we have this problem, do this custom thing. We're like, no, this is how we solve this. Yeah. It's kind of not take it or leave it, but it's kind of like there's not a lot of flexibility. And then we moved into multi-product software, which is an interesting thing we could talk about. Yeah. I think on the pricing side, one of the interesting things I find about your business that's counterintuitive to a lot of like B2B enterprise software businesses is the fact that the core And like, how do you think about free? So yeah, I used to hate free. I used I hate to think free was terrible. I think you're wrong. but. Uh, I didn't think you were wrong. I think freemium, freemium is mis it's misunderstood, right? Okay. Um, so freemium, the first thing is an acquisition model. It's not a revenue model. A lot of us think about freemium as pricing, um, when really freemium, I think you should think about it as like a premium ebook. Um, and what I mean by that is free, especially given the density of what's happening in the market. Like, look at every channel that we've had, right? You know, it used to be all these like greenfield channels of like Google for a penny a click, Facebook for five pennies a click, all this other stuff. Now that density is all all happening. You have density in the content space. There aren't these like major channels opening up. So the inevitability is we just have to get better at our jobs, but also we need to find better ways to nurture leads. And to me, based on the data that we've seen. Um, freemium is actually a really, really powerful way to do that. Um, and so I believe that every company will have freemium in some manner. Um, that doesn't mean a free version of your product. It might be something like we were talking about this before, like, like it's a tangential product that helps get that lead in. They nurture and they, you know, get to know your brand. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, you can use us for this other thing. Right. Um, I think the most successful freemium companies though, they either have like a true growth hacker, like top you know, 20 people in the world basically at freemium acquisition, or they don't come out with free for three, four years, and then it's like a top of the funnel, like free ebook kind of thing that happens. Um, it worked out for us. I think the biggest problems we had were the product can't suck. It has to be better than the paid um, competitors out there. Um, and it also has to be something where you dedicate an exorbitant amount of like effort to it. So it's not something to just like do. Like we came out with that free product using all of the profit from Price Intelligently to build that for two years before we even had a paid product that like supplemented that free product. So. And I think that's one of the that's one of the challenges that we have when um, we have a paid pro our entire product is paid. It's a uh, kind of 10, 11 million ARR kind of line of business. Yeah. How do you then go and dedicate all of that resource to the 140 something people? How do you then carve out the resource which Kind of, we're all resource constrained regardless of how many people yeah. we have. Um, and I think it's, yeah, thinking, I think the mistake that we make is thinking about it as a line of business as opposed to an acquisition channel. And then yeah. sort of, okay, how do you dedicate it to a line of business that's going to generate yeah. no re revenue? But how do you kind of dedicate it to customer acquisition? It becomes a totally. more obvious. I'm like really hopped up on this concept of leverage recently. And I think that like this is, this is leverage in a business and you have to think about it as leverage. So when we came out with free, we weren't going to give the product away for free originally. We looked at collecting survey data for pricing and we thought, is there a better way because that's, it's cumbersome, it works really well, but is there a better way that we can get that data? And then we, we originally were like, okay, we're going to be the new relic for revenue. Mm -hmm. So basically like revenue performance management, which is kind of like its own clustery field. And so we said, okay, anything we do there has to start with the money. So it started off, we were going to like try to sell this product. And then what we realized, and I'm sure there's features and products that you guys have that are very similar, where you're like, this is a good product line. Then we did the pricing research and we realized BI and analytics is a terrible space to be in. Anyone here in BI and analytics? Great. I'm sorry. Um, niche, niche BI and analytics? Yeah, data management. Data Perfect. Awesome. So non-niche BI analytics, like just generalized BI <laughs> analytics. Um, your business might still be terrible, but like I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. But it's it's more just like it's the problem is is people don't realize how much work goes into it. 
you know, they only log in maybe once a week, maybe like there's always, always power users and the willingness to pay is always terrible. Like we looked at it and we were like, all right, we can scrap this product or we could figure out like, how does this fit into the larger vision? And, and some of it was like some good post hoc rationalization of like, oh, we should do this. But then we looked at the rest of the numbers and we were like, okay, cool. Like we know that there's only so many leads in the subscription space. Like how many subscription companies do you guys think are in the world right now? Any ideas? Just shout it out. A million? A million? Where's your llama? <laughs> this guy has a llama that he normally carries around at conferences. So, a million? Anyone else? This includes media companies, box of the month clubs, which you don't really have in the UK. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Yeah. Right now, the estimates are between forty and eighty thousand. So there's not a lot, right? Someone needs to change on mobile. Yeah. No, well, yeah. The the logos on that are growing like maybe two percent. Yeah. Revenue on all those businesses is growing exponentially. And like, it's gonna grow over time, but we looked at that and we were like, all right, if we're selling to subscriptions and we wanna be a $100 million plus revenue company, like it's really, really difficult to sell something for 50 bucks a month. Like it's just not gonna work. We can't sell a Shopify to a huge base and then do like a rev share, we could, but it was one of those things where like, that's just not our business and where we are. And so that's what kind of led to like, where we can get the most leverage and the way we can get the most leverage is, hey, we're gonna give you a ton of value that you don't wanna pay for anyways and then eventually we'll sell you something that you want. Yeah. Um, which I know is like a terrible way to look at things as a bootstrapper, but like it's worked out so far. I think that's an interesting kind of piece as well. So you figure all this stuff out, you build a business, price intelligently, funds the freemium portion, kind of now you guys are scaling like crazy, um, but you're doing that still kind of on the cash flow of the business. And like one of the things that we were discussing just before this is, is the, the very different approaches that we've taken to scaling the team. Yeah. Um, you're 60, 70 people, we're 140, 150 people. And it's a vanity metric. Or it is a complete vanity metric, and I agree with you no, 100%. Um, but sort of like they're both basically the same number in terms of the challenges that you have going from like a 10, 10 person company to a yeah. slightly more than 10 person company. Um, sort of, I'm interested in, we didn't discuss this before, but I'm interested in like what broke? Everything. Yeah. Yeah. What most significantly? Like what's like the... Like me. Yeah. So, no, but I think, uh, I, I think like it's really interesting. So who here is at a company that's like doing less than 20 or 20, less than 25 team members? Let's say 26 to like 100 team members, over 100 team members. Okay. So like those are, those are kind of like what we've noticed in like studying yeah are the different like thresholds. And for us, I think like, and again, this might just be rationalization and, and it's not that money's like a bad thing. We just, there's a lot of reasons we didn't raise and it had nothing to do with like FVCs, which is like yeah. a lot of people, you know, like to say. Um, but what we noticed is like, it was a forcing function to kind of fix some of these things. A lot of the things that broke were, I mean, it was classic stuff, right? Like, oh, I was doing everything because it was literally just me in a room 18 hours a day then hired one person, this guy named Peter, who's been with us since then, and then basically like started divvying up things, then you know, brought on some other folks, then brought on Facundo to lead product, and like kind of building stuff out. And I think the things that break in those situations, it, it really is speed. And I know that's like a weird way to answer your question. We are likely moving a lot slower. We're still moving really quickly, but we are definitely moving a lot slower than um, you know, someone with funding. So to give you an example, like, you guys do this really cool ice cream truck um, at WWDC yeah. every year, consistent? Or I mean, we did it for one year and now it's become every year. Now it's like, consistent, right? It will, we'll so it's this it really cool like guerrilla marketing tactic or whatever. Um, we, I, I think you incepted me. Cause I, I, don't, I definitely did. Okay. I take full credit. Okay, I'm giving you full credit even though our events team will probably be mad at me for that. Um, but we did this ice cream truck at Saster like a couple weeks ago and we had to like talk about it like for like five meetings because it was like $25,000. How many said did we? And it was the largest thing. Yeah, I know, but like, I don't think, I, at least for me, if I had like more money in the bank, like I probably would have gone really quick. But it hits, it, hits on the, it hits on the key issue is, is sort of not necessarily scaling team, it's scaling culture. Like if you have a culture when you're yeah. 25 people, 15 people of like, we don't just make 35 grand like ice cream truck bets, bets totally. like yeah, yeah, yeah. in isolation, and it's, it's how do you scale that as a mindset? And I think that's the, the most challenging thing that, that we've had. Um, I think the hardest thing for us is we've had all of these challenges kind of all at once. We went from sort of 35 to the size that we are now in 10, 11 months. Which is insane. So you, you yeah. kind of go through, everything breaks 
successively and all at once over and over again until you sort of like you know yeah. just repeatedly fixing the same thing. I think the culture piece is like it's, it's probably the biggest thing. Like I, if you told me when I first started Price Intelligence now ProfitWell, like the biggest barriers to growth were going to be culture and people. Yeah. I would have told you, like, you're an idiot. Yeah. Like, like just it's stupidly, exactly the same right? Thing. Yeah. Um, oh, no, it's going to be the product, it's going to be marketing, it's going to be sales, like, something's going to go wrong, it's going to be competitors. And really, it's like, it's the alignment. Because if you think about it, and this is like something that's been said a lot, which is like, at that point, your company or your product becomes your company in, in some, some manner, if not the full meaning of that phrase. And I think at least for the us. Bad, the bad parts, yeah. like, more than anything else. Well, and we notice, we notice something's wrong whenever we have just irrational debates or like irrational thing. Like they're not irrational, but like we had a 45 minute argument in an all hands about snacks. And it was Been like, there. like we knew, yeah. We knew something was wrong because, and it wasn't that people were like F this or like cutthroat. Like we took away the Diet Coke and that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> um, just cause we were like on this healthier kick thing and like we were like, hey, you can bring whatever you want. Anyways, I don't want to get into it because like I'm still sore about it. But um, <laughs> basically, like that, that's when we were like, okay, there's something, something's going on. Things are either too good right now, and that's what we're worried about, which is not, not a bad thing, or like there's just some alignment of what's important. And it was really kind of cool is we have a small office in Rosario, Argentina of about 10 folks. Um, and the leader of that office said, hey, like after that meeting, we had a conversation as a group down here, and we like, we actually want less snacks. And we're like, Okay, what's going on? He's like, well, it's about the product. Like, it's not about its snacks. Like, that's not why we come here. Like, it's about the product. And I was like, holy shit, Rafa. Like, you're amazing. <laughs> and like, then he like shared the story about it. And then the rest of the company was like, yeah, we're being like childish about yeah. this. Like, not everyone. Like, we still hear about Diet Coke and the damn OKR meetings and all that. The kind cereals. Of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The cereal, cereals the here. The cereal debate. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think that's where it's like, okay, what are we like? There's something wrong where we're not communicating. And it's not that snacks aren't important. It's just that like. <laughs> Can't believe, snacks are important. I can't believe Patrick. I just said that. Um, <laughs> that made me hurt so much. Um, it's not that they're not important. It's just that they're, it's like, that's not what, why we're here. Like, we're here to hopefully do something great, to focus on, on a mission. Not, maybe it's not the company mission that you're bought into as much. You're bought into, like, your individual learning mission. Um, you like the people you're working with. Like, that's why you're here. Um, and all that other stuff is ancillary. So whenever we notice stuff like that, and then, then there will be, like, other decisions that just defy common sense. Like we had this thing involving like logos we were gonna use as like testimonials. And our, our new head of growth who comes from a little bit more of a corporate background was like, oh, we need to buy this like brand management tool for like 10 grand a year. And we're like, why, what is going on? Whenever that stuff happens, we know that like there's an alignment fix that needs to happen. And normally we fix those alignment fixes by like literally identifying where was the breakdown, talking about it. And then we write, we're starting to write so much more than we used to. Just like publicly, like sharing notion files, like just like, hey, here are these thoughts on this. Here are the thoughts on this. It'll spark some debate, and then normally it gets everyone back on board. Yeah. The biggest thing for us has been kind of this renewed focus, um, kind of outside of the product and engineering teams on writing stuff down, like yeah. writing learnings down. I think the thing, the biggest thing that when we went, when we did this sort of big hiring and, and the team got bigger, is kind of you have. We've been around for six, nearly seven years. There is 20-something people on the team who've been here for maybe four of those. Like, how do you accelerate the yeah. other 100 people on the four years of context that they, or the six years or the seven yeah. years of context that they missed out on? And sort of, I think one of the things that we did badly, like throughout that process initially was, someone comes in, they have an idea, it's a stupid idea. And like it's an, it's not a Harsh. stupid idea, but yeah. it's a stupid idea because we tried that, um, and it didn't know. work. Yeah. And like the immediate reaction from some of the team is like, no, that'll not work. Like without giving the context. Yeah. And I think that's been a really hard thing for me, but like for a lot of the team, in terms of kind of there has to be this deliberate focus on education of, of the team, both in terms of the things that worked and didn't work historically, yeah. um, and kind of bringing them up to speed. But sort of how are you thinking about Obviously, you learn a bunch going from whatever the team was yeah. to whatever it is now. Like, how are you thinking about what the next hundred people? Totally. We think a lot about um, feedback, and along with feedback goes, we, we kind of house it. It's like a secondary definition of integrity, which is basically like 
like, we, like maybe speak more plainly, like we try to squash as much gossip and siloing as possible. That just kind of sparked me thinking about this because the company I was at directly before President Intelligence and now ProfitWell was um, a company that raised a ton of money um, and just didn't focus enough on culture. And you would notice like a lot of siloing of like all these like, people would just grab conference rooms and like, like you, you knew they were like talking shit about something in the yeah. conference room and like it was just something. And so when started Price Intelligently, like this whole concept, we say it a lot, like feedback is non-negotiable. Like the way you receive feedback, very negotiable. Like feedback is just completely non-negotiable. And so what that's, that's kind of imbued is like the easy feedback is, is normally easy, right? The, the harder stuff, it's, hey, maybe I don't necessarily want to give it directly. And then we have this hierarchy of feedback, which is, um, you know, directly to the person, like that maintains like the best, like, texture of that feedback, um, going to someone tangential to them, going to someone like HR, um, going to a Slack channel. We have this like one-way feedback Slack channel where like you can't respond to feedback there. You just have to give it. It's mostly like ideas. That's where a lot of stuff goes because some people are scared to share ideas when instantly someone's going to jump in and be like, this is terrible like because of XYZ. And then we have like a form and then we have this anonymous form. And like what we try to do is basically like if you've reached the anonymous form, it's either like some, some major failure has happened. Either like s something terrible, God forbid, has happened, meaning like, you know, just bad stuff that I'm sure you can imagine. Um, or like that person didn't feel comfortable going to all of these different steps. And so we literally as an ops team, we look at how many responses we got to the anonymous form and like we try to minimize those to zero as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of educating because we would start to get stuff in the anonymous form that was like, oh, the Diet Coke's gone, yeah. right? <laughs> and it was like, that's not, and we would have to be like, guys, like, this is serious, like, this is, this is the kind of stuff, like. Yeah, this is the last resort form. Yeah, this is not the last the, resort form. I'm embarrassed place. to say it. Before. Yeah, yeah, totally, and if you're embarrassed to say it, part of that, like, feedback's important, like, part of that's on you uh, as the receiver of the feedback. Like, if they don't feel comfortable telling you, like, hey, the Diet Coke thing bothers me, like, then you're, you know, you're one of those ogre, you know, type situations, and I think that that's, that's super tough, because I'm, not a non-aggressive person, let's just say. Um, and so I know that giving feedback, but that's like a constant, like every day, like that alignment helps. Like I can't imagine scaling as fast as you have, like just given the problems that we've had, um, which I imagine are similar to, to ones that you've had because they just affect all kinds of companies. I think it just has to be, it doesn't stop being the most important thing that you focus on, but it quickly becomes it, especially as you start yeah. noticing things around the organization that you don't like anymore like behaviors yeah. and traits that you don't like, that you kind of have to deliberately try and, try and eke out of people and, and try and remove from, from Or the evaluate culture. whether they're, yeah. that's you. Oh, you for know? sure. I find that too, where there's like, I would not do it that way. Okay, it's okay that it's done that way though, yeah. that kind of thing, that's tough. What's the, what's the, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Great. Um, what's the biggest mistake that you think that you've made throughout this like culture, kind of scaling culture, Jesus. scaling the team? Um, oh, Diet Coke, the biggest mistake. It's not Diet Coke. Um, oh, I want to say, I don't know. I, there's not like a, thankfully there's not like a glaring one. There's like a lot of little ones. Like I, um, I used to be like, I don't know how it was with you, but like, I, I'm a, I'm an incredibly insecure person. Um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think that what that's done is like, I can go into like frantic panic mode um, pretty easily. And so I think that um, not as much anymore, like in the past, like let's say three years, but in the first like year or two of the business, like because we didn't have any funding, and it wasn't just because we didn't have any funding, because people with funding had the same situation, but like everything was, oh my God, that's gonna threaten the entire business. And rather being like cool, calm, and collected, and being like, cool, like let's figure this out. It was very much like, what the fuck is going on? Why did you do it this way? Like, not in like a yelling way, but just in like a very like direct, like not helping them. More so, like, oh my god, we have to fix this right now. We have to like take care of it. And I think now it's like a lot of those situations. It's like let's ask like seven questions first. Let's figure out what's going on. Because most of the time, now it's other people being frantic. And that helped me a lot, is like seeing other people be that way. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like. That's terrible. Like, let yeah. me, you know, let me be better. I think some other things, 
I don't know, Brian, where are you? What, anything else that's terrible? Put me on the spot. <laughs> Brian's been in the company for like four years now, so he's seen a lot. Um, oh, the other thing, oh, this is actually a really good one. I just thought of this because, so Brian, um, his boss is Peter, who's been basically with me for six years at this point. Um, I consider him like more of a co-founder than, than anyone. And he, um, arguing publicly, that, that's a big thing. Um, arguing publicly, like, and Peter and I were like deep brothers at this point, and so sometimes we bicker like brothers. And that, we're totally cool, and we get it, and we're gonna like, you know, hug it out afterwards and like go get dinner or something like that. Yeah. The team doesn't realize that, especially yeah. as you grow. Um, and our head of product is a very prototypical, stereotypical head of product, and also has very, very strong opinions. So most of like our arguments, they're not like volatile, like, oh my God, but it still feels like, oh, mommy and daddy are fighting, like what's going mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Um, so we stopped having those like publicly, and, and most of those are like not volatile at all anymore because now we've like worked on our relationships. Um, but I think it's, yeah, no, like it, it, that's, it's weird, but like I started treating both Facundo and Peter like basically partners and that like helped a lot. Um, but yeah, that was, that was maybe one tactical thing is like not arguing in public. Yeah. yeah, I think the similar for me of um, going through that process from being a small team to a big team is the pr also the internal like self process of realizing that you're the CEO. Yeah, and kind of when you say stuff, it's sort of either going to be taken as sort of a comment, a joke, an order, um, or sort of like make someone's day ruin someone's day. Yeah, and like that's something I struggle with for a long time. To the point where I just then stopped just like kind of giving any kind of like That's feedback to people yeah. publicly and then uh, kind of found a nice happy medium. Um, I try to minimize that as much. Like I try, there's always going to be this like, oh, this is my boss, that vibe that people get. It's just really hard to avoid. I go out of my way to like try to nip that in the bud. So we'll, we'll have like interns who are scared to say something because yeah. like it's the first job they've ever had or something like that. And like we'll go out of our way to be like, no, what's terrible? Tell us what's terrible. Oh, you're like the CEO. Yeah, we're trying to listen. yeah and that helps a lot. Um, and just get to the feedback part. We started doing something just recently. Uh, Toyota has this interesting model where new hires at like their headquarters, there's this red square that they have on the factory floor. And any, any new hire their first week, their first Friday, they have to stand in the red square until they see one thing that should be fixed or one thing that should be better. Um, and so we started doing something similar just to like start to, and there's a bunch of other stuff, but just to kind of like, no, 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 everything can be better. Like feedback is great. Everyone should be sharing it, that type of thing, which kind of helps with the like yeah. call to the CEO. It's sort of, yeah, it sort of just has to happen once. And then it's kind of <laughs> becomes routine, like for an individual. Know. Yeah, I don't know if like w some individuals. Yeah. Like you, have, you do that, not have this problem with engineers, yeah. like typically. That's been my, yeah. that's been my problem is my, one of my early kind of learnings was that I like to receive feedback in one very specific way, which so is everyone very, should receive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which yeah. is very directly. I've made that mistake too. Almost yeah. like reasonably offensively, so I get it. Um, with colorful language and everything. And then sort of started giving people feedback in that way. And the first, like, I don't know where they are, they're probably here somewhere, but like the first six or seven people in the company unfortunately had to deal with Christian who only knew how to give feedback in a like, that's shit, fix it kind of way, yeah. rather than a like, maybe this could be better. Um, which I've since learned how to do, but I think this, like growing as a manager, as a leader is, is sort of, yeah. especially when you're first time founder and kind of, well for me it was first time founder and also I'd never had a job. Um, <laughs> so I dropped out of school when I was 16, I started this when I was 18. Um, kind of seven years ago, six, six years ago, and then sort of, you also don't, you don't necessarily know what good or bad looks like. Yeah. Um, and I think there is this interesting, like, title bias that people have. Yeah. Of, like, I only really noticed it in the last kind of couple of years, and, and someone said it to me in a one-on-one, -on -one of like, when you have a person in a role that you don't know particularly well, like they haven't got to know me very well, they haven't got to know our CTO very well, you immediately attribute the worst person that you've ever experienced mm. who has that title to the individual who's in front of you right now. So the worst CEO that you've ever experienced. Yeah. And then you attribute all of those traits of like, oh, they didn't like feedback, I couldn't talk to them, I couldn't yeah. do any of these things. That was like a big kind of unlock for me was just like thinking like, 
deliberate effort to make sure like I kind of rebrand who I am in their mind. Yeah. Kind of immediately upon sort of the first week or two of, of, of meeting them, of, of yeah. them being in the company. That's cool. The one other thing that I think we do that might help with that if, if you guys aren't doing something similar. So we have this, we didn't come up with this, but it's this concept of the most charitable interpretation um, principle, which is basically like if you say, hey, that's shit, like fix it. There's, there's, even if you deliver it aggressively, like there's two, there's two ways to interpret that. The easiest interpretation there is the negative one, right? And that you should work to like not make it easy to take the negative one, right? Like yeah. we all do, but we all, we're all gonna slip up, right? The most charitable interpretation is Christian really cares about this and he's right, it's wrong, so it needs to be fixed, right? And it's not to say like you, it's okay for you know, us to be really like aggressive and direct, but it is, it is one of those things that it helps a lot because when you don't have that connection, like we had a situation where um, like this, this new hire, first job out of school, um, like there was something I said in all hands and I hadn't had one conversation because we hadn't, we, normally I try to do like one coffee meeting in the first like two weeks, but I was just traveling or something and I hadn't had that yet. And I had said something and just took the most like negative interpretation of it and kind of put a little bit of him into a tailspin and I, like you just said, I had no idea, right? Yeah. Um, and so like teaching that, and we really talk about that. So like we'll have people come to me complaining about Facundo or complaining about Peter. And what we'll do is, is like we all kind of do this together is like, you know, when, when it's clearly something wrong, we'll directly go to the other person and be like, dude, come on, like what the fuck, right? Like, but when it's something that's like pretty gray, like that's what we'll do as execs is we'll like talk through it with that person and be like, well, is that the most, like, is that the most charitable interpretation? Or like, what's yeah. the most charitable interpretation? Um, which gets a little dangerous because there are things that are like really clearly wrong that you don't want someone to like just throw under the rug. But normally it's more just like focusing people to be a little bit more critical or put some critical thought into like the situation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's it's just been one of the biggest challenges for me is like, because yeah. it's an ever changing environment, especially when you're hiring quickly. Totally. Um, well, it's also like, I think the other thing, not to talk about more problems, um, like the other thing that was like terrible was like when to fire someone. So we had a situation, we have a couple situations where like we'll hire, you know, being bootstrapped, ah, it's too expensive. Let's hire the like person who we rationalize into having really high potential. And like, well, we got that one really right. Like there was this intern really early on. He was our first like team member besides Peter and he was an intern on marketing and now he's like a principal engineer over the past like five years and he's just really good. Um, and so we're like, well, there's always, there's always potential there's going to be an Eric. When in reality, like it's probably rare. And so it's, it, what happens is someone's like not great. And if you haven't fired someone before, you're like, well, it's probably me. Like I did something wrong. Like, and then you're sitting there and you're trying to go through the calculus and like, then it's nine months later and all of a sudden you're like, oh crap. Like now I'm going to tell this person that they're like, oh, and they're going to be like, well, I thought everything was okay. Yeah. Like, you know, that's like a classic thing that a lot of people go through. Yeah. I think that we're kind of gradually running out of time. Um, nice. But. I think we have some time for questions, if people have questions. Uh, I think we have this like throwable microphone. I'm gonna, it's gonna be your responsibility to throw it to the next person. You got person. banned from Twitter? Oh, shit. <laughs> did you really get banned from yeah, Twitter? Yeah, I did. We'll get to that in a minute. It's the <laughs> lost. I just wanted to ask you how, you know, to keep everyone on track and communicate your vision to your employees, and you know, how often do you do that? Yeah, mm. that's basically. So for me, um, didn't do it very well for a long time. And kind of you go through this process of like the first six people know the vision really well. And kind of everybody is working towards the same thing. And then kind of it gradually, for me, got diluted over time. Um, because sort of as there are more people in the room, you have to get a lot more deliberate about the things that you say and a lot more repetitive about the things that you say. Um, to the point where it's, for you, it's some, somewhat annoying the fact that you're saying this for the 14th time. Um, but your 14th time is somebody's seventh is somebody's first. Um, so for me on vision, it was repetition um, and maintains to be repetition. Um, the, biggest of, the biggest thing of keeping everybody on track and aligned has been recently um, kind of just over communication of like metrics, but from the team upwards. So every Monday and Friday, various teams in the business send an email like summary just to the rest of the team. And I think that has given us the forum to just, for people to ask questions. 
and the the most like probing insight that we get is from kind of people asking questions in those kind of all company emails. It's very easy with a hundred and how many people to get lost in Slack. Yeah. Um, the internal documentation thing has been really valuable as well of, of just making sure all the stuff's written down. Um, onboarding uh, as well of new people, of like making sure mission and vision and kind of core resources that you can use and read um, and expectations around, yeah, if you see Christian in like walking around, just grab him and ask him a question or question him on something. Um, I think making those things really explicit and deliberate to people when they join and in perpetuity is really important. I don't know about you. Yeah, so just writing a lot of stuff down. It's because it's all in your head, typically, and it's evolving. So we, we just started using Notion. Like we had a, we were using a wiki and, you know, all products, people love Notion right now. And so like it started to like, you know, virus across the company. Um, so we started using like just, we split, the, the first thing we did was really org structure because, and, and you don't think about that when it comes to mission vision, but like, you know, not to go militaristic, but like, if you think about the, like the chain of command, if you will, like where are people getting their information? Um, a lot of times if you don't have like clear org structure, it's like really hard to identify where problems are. And it doesn't mean like you should have a hierarchical organization, at least in my opinion, like we do a lot of decentralized like decisions and all that kind of stuff. But it's more just like, all right, we have a product side and we have a revenue side. And then at that point, Basically, Facundo runs the product side, I run the revenue side, and eventually I'm not going to anymore, and I'm gonna like go above and do all the like fun alignment stuff because there's just so much work there. Um, but we started writing, agreeing on the other thing that the other person had written, and then started just evangelizing that to the team. Um, and then once we have the high vision, we go one step down to um, each the revenue and the product, and then we go one step down to like sales, marketing, et cetera. Um, and one thing that really helped as a forcing function this was OKRs. Um, and I know it's like, those are like shorter term goals, um, but every OKR season, and we do them quarterly, um, and every all hands, we just repeat all the time, like what are we doing, what are we going after, et cetera. And so it just is like imbued to the point where people can repeat it within like a few words, like what we're focused on, and they hopefully should understand it, and if they don't, they ask about it. Yeah, we failed miserably at OKRs. Like we did them for, yeah, like we're seven, seven, eight quarters. Yeah, um, we have then, a yellow light on our OKRs. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what's your conversion rate from free to paid user? I'm saying this to you because it's the top question, and we don't have a free product. It's anonymous though, so I don't know. Um, our conversion rate—it's—it's it's a little bit tough because like um, we have multi-product. Yeah. So like right now, net new leads, it's about three percent. Um, but what, here's a funny thing about any, anyone here have a freemium model? Okay, so just a few of you. Um, if you're not doing cohorts for your freemium, you should. So meaning like looking at when they came in free and then basically when they convert, because then if you look at it like that, then our conversion rate goes up a lot more um, you know, over time, because we don't want to look at like one month for that, because yeah. we're not trying to inundate them with like, hey, sign up for, for the first month. Uh, I'll just do the ban from Twitter story quickly. Yeah, what happened? Um, it, I wish it was a really exciting story. I wish I was like like really pro Trump, but uh, it's not that. Um, Jesus. <laughs> Brexit, yay. yay! No, I'm just kidding. No, I don't um, know enough. I don't. Know I was enough. like 12 yeah. when I signed up for Twitter. Okay. Um, and sort of at some point or another, they realized that. Uh, and Twitter doesn't have the technical functionality to be able to delete tweets before a certain date right now. So until they have that, my account's locked. Um, and Did you tweet some weird stuff? No, no, it's just like they're not allowed, because there has to be like, the, if you're under 13, you have to have parental yeah. consent. And I didn't have parental consent when I signed up. So I have to wait until, they need to delete all the activity from when I was it's kind of younger than 13. Is it public right now? No, no, it's, oh, it just okay. comes up banned. I just want to go see it. Yeah. Just like see um, if anybody knows anyone at Twitter, please. Yeah, yeah. good luck. <laughs> don't, don't DM me, but like email yeah. or something. Cause, That's good. Um, uh, what's one thing that worries you all the time about running a company? Like right now, it's kind of, it's not failure in the sense of like, um, like when you get to 10 million plus, like now it's like yours to lose, at least in my opinion. Um, not that like your, you know, competitors aren't going to come in and like crush you or whatever, but like in the sense of you've proven that you can build something, now you have to scale it. And that's not, it's very different than the failure of, oh my God, are we going to go out of business because we're going to miss cash flow or some giant thing's going to happen. But yeah, that's the biggest It's thing. like the missed opportunity side of things. It's like, totally. look at all this 
potential that we have. To yeah, because it's always like in the early days, it's like, oh, you have so much potential. Like right. when you got that first check, it was like, I don't know, you're smart. You're going to figure something out, right? And that's like a cool thing you can ride for a while. Yeah. And then all of a sudden when you realize like the first stage of that potential, it's like, oh man, stakes get much, much higher. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the three most important points to keep in mind when you're trying to maintain com like company culture as you scale? Go ahead. Oh, I'll do on. one, you do two. Oh, great. Um, I think the one of the big ones sort of that for me was I was completely unaware of the idea of just like diversity as an important mm -hmm. thing. Being like 18 year old kid, my co founder was also 18. Like, it's like very, very quickly. You're both white, too. Yeah, we're both white. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, sort of like you're seven people and it's just sort of under 25 white dudes in a room, um, kind of all laughing at the same jokes. Uh, and you realize that you're missing out on a lot of kind of contribution, especially when you're talking to customers and yeah. like when you're thinking about the product and, and things like that. So, and also when trying to hire and attract, attract talent. Um, Nobody wants to be the first anything, especially in an environment that doesn't look particularly welcoming. Yeah. Um, so I think doing that early and kind of really having a focus on those things really early is, is important. Yeah, jumping off that, I think for me it was like having, learning to have strong convictions that weren't accommodating always. So I think that um, there's, there's some situations where, you know, like, this is, dangerous because um, it can go off the rails real quick. Um, so give me the most charitable interpretation of the limited story I'm about to share. Um, there, there are certain things like as, as, a, as, you know, as a white guy, like I'll have someone, you know, like we had someone in the organization be like, well, this is how all women think. Like you need to do this thing because this is how all women think. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I want to be accommodating. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. But like, I, I'm not a woman. I didn't go through X, Y, Z. So like, you must be right, right? Um, and so that, that was like really tough um, in, in a couple of situations because then I would go like collect more information and like I would hear seven different opinions. And it, you know, the, the bigger lesson here is that like, even though like obviously diversity is super important is like not, like not tokenizing people and not like painting with a really broad brush. Like it's the core of what diversity really means, um, which is making sure you have a really diverse culture. And then the aspects of conviction I think that um, because of that accommodation, there was just a lot of things where, you know, um, we got into like the trap of like, you know, work-life balance, right? And I think work-life balance is a really misunderstood concept. I think a lot of people, um, it, it shouldn't be so misunderstood, but it's like work-life balance doesn't mean working 35 hours a week, um, you know, doing X, Y, Z. It's a little bit different for everyone. Um, and I think what we found is there were people who were like really into their work um, or really wanted to ship something one week and then they wanted to like go a little light next week. Um, but there was a lot of like, oh yeah, like, you know, we're like work-life balance culture. And, and that like affected us in a way where it was like, well, no, like we're, we're going for something big here and we want people who are gonna work really hard and who can manage themselves and don't need us to like, you know, give them a gym membership and do all of these other things. Although we do like accommodate a lot of stuff. And so that was a really tough thing because we were like, well, let's just hire remote people. It's like, this just wasn't us. And so we were just like, no, this isn't us. We need people in the same office right now or in one of our offices. And then we had a couple of other things where it was like, it, it put us in a couple situations where people wanted to work from home like three days a week. And we were just like, I don't know if this is the right place for you because it's just not what we're doing right now. And it's not to judge them. It's just, you know, it's just not where we were, if that makes sense. I also think that things like that Kind of, you need the infrastructure to be able to support all of these different types yeah. of people. Like, if you have people, we have, we, for a long time, there was no work, no work from home here. Um, now we have people who work from home regular basis. We have a few completely remote employees. Um, but it's like very, very evident to me that that wouldn't have worked on the basis of like having this split. Okay, 98% of the team is in one place and then yeah. you have two people remote. Like, so tough. Unless you build the infrastructure and do it deliberately. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, you pick one. What do you want to do? Yeah, this last one's interesting. We were talking about this. Uh, what do you think of, is it Revolut? Revolut? Yeah. 
uh, with their rapid growth, got wrong considering the bad press they've been getting for their company culture. I don't know the full story. I only saw the Slack message, which yeah. I also don't remember the full Slack message, so I don't really want to comment. Um, I will say, I think that um, as a CEO, as a leader of a company, you have a lot of influence on, like you shouldn't, but you have a lot of influence on like how people perceive what's right and wrong. Um, and I think that that, I don't know if that Slack message was to like everyone in the entire company, but if it was, it probably wasn't a great, yeah. like a great thing. Yeah. Um, and I think like my other- the, Just for context, the Slack message that I read was like, Go yeah. to the KPIs. Yeah. If you're not hitting your KPIs, yeah. you got to be working weekends. Yeah, something and like, like that. anybody who doesn't get a favorable review is fired and, and stuff like that. Oh, I didn't remember right. that part. I saw that one. That's great. Um, but I think, like, Jesus. I think there's no excuse for that stuff and like building a good culture on those things. But I do think, somewhat, and charitable interpretation, etc. Nice. Um, of, like, if you think how quickly that company has grown. Yeah. Like headcount, just headcount wise. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, like that's difficult to manage, like in any best case, worst case scenario, like whatever. Um, that's tricky, and stuff's gonna happen. Like, and I think it's more about how you react to the things that happen rather than the fact that they happen at all. Yeah. Um, it sounds like there's been some bad reactions to the things that have happened. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a challenging thing for any founder, sort of exec team to go through of, like, going from kind of a couple of hundred to 700 people yeah. so almost overnight, but. Yeah, yeah, I think, and I guess there's some other stuff going on with bad press, I think it's all compounding. I will say, like, on the work-life balance thing, I had, someone told me this in my career, which was really interesting, and I've, I've told this to some other people as well, where, like, there's really young up-and-comer or, like, mid-career, it doesn't have to be a young person, who, like, want to get to the next level, and their career is really, really important to them and they're willing to do things in their career at the expense of like their personal life or whatever it is. They're not gonna travel as much because they're gonna work more. Um, they're not focused on like getting to 2% body fat because you know, they're gonna work, they're gonna go work more, right? There's a lot of things that they're doing for trade-offs. That's my current focus. If you can is that your, that's yeah, mine yeah, as well. Um, I did go to the gym after I got off the plane this morning. I'm very proud of it. Um, just putting that up. Thank you, thank you, that's right. This is, that was the saddest clap <laughs> I've ever panned for. But, um, and then there's people who their most important thing is their family at the time, their personal stuff, all that kind of stuff. One is not right, one is not wrong. I Absolutely. think that we get in too much of a mindset of one being right, one being wrong. I think you do need to manage, especially the people who are working their asses off, like, hey, you need a break, you know, you're burning out, et cetera. But I think that, like, to me, someone told me early in my career, it's like, listen, like, choose a path right now. One is not right, one is not wrong, but which one do you want to be, and I'm going to act accordingly. So when I said, hey, I want to, like, work my ass off, like, let's, you know, figure all this stuff out and learn path, like, they treated me, like, basically in, in a manner that was, like, not like, hey, you should be working this weekend, but, like, hey, like, it's really important, like, here, I'm giving you this really special project. It's got to be done by Tuesday. Like, let me know how I can unblock you. And some of that stuff I had to work the weekend on. And so I think that it, as long as it's a choice and it's not something where you're just like, you know, if you get yeah. a bad review, you're fired. I think it's you know, something that's okay. That's be right for the individual. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. I don't know whether we want to do it from here or if anybody has one. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. 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 So we do a bunch of stuff really deliberately um, around this. I think one, recognizing that the stuff that we're doing is stressful. Um, and kind of, that's gonna like peak and trough like at different points around product launches and things like that. But one of the, so we do a couple of things. We do one, um, we have, uh, we work with a company called Sanctus um, who are like mental health, um, I don't even know what you call it, uh, mental health coach gym type thing. Um, so they come in once a week um, and sort of 
do sort of like office hours type thing with people to kind of give them an outlet that isn't with somebody who works here. Um, give them an outlet to sort of just like get all this stuff off their chest. Um, we have been actually putting a lot of focus on sort of like mental health and well-being uh, in the company. Recently, um, we trained sort of about 20 people in the organization on um, kind of this thing that we're calling like mental health first aid. Um, and uh, kind of a couple of times a week, we book out some rooms like on a different floor that isn't in our office in this building. Um, and one of those people who will be like a colleague will go and sit in the room for three or four hours and, and kind of kind of people can just drop in and, um, and they're there to sort of help and guide. But a lot of this stuff we try and just put on the um, kind of on, it's I think taking a proactive approach is helpful as well of like kind of making people aware of it that they can talk about it that um, sort of the and also kind of with managers and, and things like that giving them the tools to have difficult conversations with people um, so we put a lot of emphasis on that re recently um, not in reaction to anything specifically but just actually realizing that oh we want to ship a new product and kind of some people have been working late or kind of like putting themselves through stress and um, so that's been a focus. I think um, I think a lot of it goes back to like the not having public arguments type of thing mm -hmm. of if you're visibly in like the panic mode, if you're visibly yeah. stressed about something um, to the team, I think you shouldn't hide that stuff. But it's not it's kind of not okay to be visibly stressed to the team like in kind of their peripheral vision. Yeah. And sort of they kind of are panicking about the fact that you're stressed and you're not actually having an open conversation about it, I think that's sort of one of the responsibilities that I have, at least, is to say, like, look, this is pretty shitty. Um, like, or like, that was like three weeks of late nights, um, rather than it kind of just being this unspoken thing. Yeah. I don't know about you. I think we, so in a state, I don't know how actually it is here with um, the health service, but we just made sure our insurance covered like therapy and stuff like that. Because um, you'd be surprised, like a lot of insurance in the states, like, and there's just stigma globally. I feel about like that kind of stuff, but I think more tactically, um, like, we're at a size where I can be pretty vigilant about like what's going on. And I'm not the best like person because I like this is you know this is my life and I love what I do and like I work a lot and so um, I can recognize burnout pretty well because I've been burned out my for myself before. And so like just making sure the management team is aware. Um, I think some other tactical things we do, though, um, you know, we have a meditation room, you know, it's dedicated to, like, meditation. Um, we also, um, I really focus on when people start and anyone that reports to me, I talk to them about what would you resent me or the company for if you missed it or weren't able to do it? Um, because there's a lot of things where, like, you're not managing, like, workload necessarily, you're managing balance, right? And so there's a lot of people like, hey, if I don't get to my kid's soccer game or football game, you know, what, that, that's going to kill me. If I don't get Sunday night dinners, that's going to kill me. If I don't have complete off no messages on Saturday or no messages on the weekend, like that's gonna, I'm going to resent the company for that. That helps a lot because that's where like, you start to lose people on burnout is because there's like, some resentment that starts to build, either from themselves or like, the entire company or you as a manager. Um, and I think also just like being real vulnerable, vulnerable and openly vulnerable about it. Um, like, you know, the last all hands, I was like, hey, like I'm, I was like, there's a section in our all hands where it's like, what's on your mind for Facundo and myself, um, or head of product and myself. And one thing I mentioned, I was like, listen, I'm like overwhelmed right now because like it's just different problems and they're not tactical problems. They're not like, hey, go write a blog post or like go do this thing. It was, hey, like I'm overwhelmed because I there's so much like broken stuff and the alignment stuff that we're working on and that like helps because then people dm me and they're like oh cool like it's it's good to hear that you're overwhelmed because i'm overwhelmed and i can go cool like how can we help each other like that type of thing so i think it's just like diligence and like you know vigilance around like helping each other out i, I do think that you know it's it's hard to go like all in on this kind of stuff because everyone's so different um you know we we try to oh, here's a meditation room. And then like, it's like, that's not gonna solve like the problem. You have to just like make it a part of the company, at least in my opinion. No, I completely agree. And on that note, I think we've run out of time. Um, 
Bar's closed. Yeah. Sorry, I guys. think there's still no. drinks and then maybe food. I don't That's know. good. So I'm not going to promise. Um, this was like so many more feelings than I thought we were going to talk about. I know. I thought I was going to be up here like, well, when you take your turn and you like <laughs> put it over your cat, like yeah. that's what I thought was going to happen. That's next time. That's next time. Uh, but thank you so much for coming over, for especially me, getting off a plane this morning. Um, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this one. Thank you. Let's get it up the paddle. They bought the drinks tonight. Let's get it up the paddle. Personal credit card.